Hi, I'm Dylan Cuthbert. I'm the founder of Q Games here in Kyoto, Japan. And I worked on the original Star Fox back 30 years ago. After starting Q Games, uh, we also worked on Star Fox Command, Star Fox 3DS, and I also worked on Star Fox 2 back in the day as well uh, when I was at Nintendo. This video is kind of a retrospective. We're going to look at the game. Uh, I'm going to answer questions. And we also have some signed goodies to give away. So let's get on with it. Okay, here we are, 30 years of Star Fox. And I'm going to take a look at the game. Uh, I haven't looked at it for a while. And I'm going to sort of go through a few of the stages and uh, do a little bit of commentary on uh, what's going on behind the scenes. So here we are launching out of the base. Um, this is one of the first sequences of the game. Of course, the game's full of uh, sequences like this, which actually makes it quite different to uh, similar games that came before it, you know, like sort of shooting games. Um, so here, uh, it's kind of kind of similar to one of the first prototype stages we made, actually, like the, the tunnel and the little radars. These, these models probably didn't change from the first prototype. And uh, we kind of added you know, all the scripting for the, the enemies flying around and uh, we created like special scripting language for that. And these robots were one of the first animation, uh, yeah, anima animated uh, parts of the game. And here we kind of use a, uh, a sort of secret system. So there's parts in the stage that you can't see. And if you trigger them, they'll actually create other parts of the stage um, and a lot of people probably have found those little secrets like if you fly between two specific buildings suddenly you'll get uh, like a, a bomb that appears in front of you that you can collect things like that um, this is part of a, one of the kind of cool parts of our, of our system the map itself is an event system so when the player gets past a certain point going forward you can create an object at any point in the view that you can see. So we can actually have it so it creates objects like that are one meter away or five meters away or 50 meters away, it doesn't matter. Um, but that gave us a lot of control over the gameplay uh, of the stages and let, let us surprise the player as well because you can have like uh, enemies created right behind buildings as you fly past them and they're not just waiting there, they actually appear as you go past them and you don't really notice it. There's a good mix of polygons and also sprites as well, but these are hard, uh, not hardware sprites, these are uh, rendered sprites, like these bullets and explosions. And we have a pretty fast uh, renderer for, for those. And here's a sequence, so you see there, you go between those buildings there, and then it starts to create sequences uh, as you go through certain sections. And Yamada, the uh, main map designer, uh, used this to great effect. Um, everywhere really uh, on a lot of the stages but he used it to create like sort of puzzle sequences and stuff like that you know tunnels uh, or path, um, barriers that can be switched left and right uh, and just made things appear right in front of the player sometimes as well which is a bit annoying but uh, part of the game design I think and stuff like that you know triggering the, the falling over of the, uh, the pillars and things like that Oh, here it comes trundling on. So this is the third route, which is like the sunset route and the hardest route of the game. And it is very hard. I haven't seen this boss for a while, actually. Um, so yeah, I mean, I just usually use my smart bomb. It's the best way to kill this boss. As soon as he opens those little turrets up, and then you see the flashing orange yellow part. Um, fire the smart bomb, smash them all, that's the way to do it. But one of the kind of unique features of this game as well is the, um, the hit flash we have on things. Uh, the colour of it is different depending on whether they'll actually drop something uh, after, you know, when, you, when it's destroyed or not. So if it's, if it's white, it'll just blow up. And if it's yellow, you get like a special little thing drop. That's a little touch we added. So we started 
programming Star Fox when I was about, well, I started programming it when I was about, uh, I think I was 19. Uh, basically, at that age, you know, nothing was impossible. So um, we'd often tell the, the people at Nintendo when they asked us uh, to program certain features that we just didn't want to do, we'd then tell them it was impossible. Um, but in fact, nothing was really uh, impossible, anything. We could actually do anything at that point, we thought, in our minds at least. Um, and because of that, I think that's how we got away with it. That's kind of how we got to make the game. Because if you think things are too hard, you're just never going to overcome them. So you just have to have the confidence and push ahead. And I think that's what really shows. And the fact that we made it in less than a year uh, with like God knows how many bosses and enemies and sequences and stuff like that that we've never done before um, kind of shows uh, how that way of thinking works. So here we are, this is a, a first person mode we added uh, for the game because in space we found it was very difficult to actually track where you were on the, sort of horizontally. Um, you know, when you're on the ground, you get a much better sense of that. And so we created this first person mode to give a more sort of like, very much more a cockpit kind of feel. And in order to do this, I mean, most, some people probably, you know, the, the hardcore fans probably noticed, but it, when you're in this mode, you can actually fly further left or right than you can in the regular mode. So when you're flying in your normal ship, like in the outside view, uh, you have a more limited uh, amount of movement uh, horizontally. And um, this doesn't actually affect or change the game it was just something we found natural because if we if the range on the left and right on the horizontal was uh, the same as when you're outside the craft it felt very restrictive um, even though you don't notice it when you're in that view normally so uh, no one really noticed uh, that difference at all but it's it's uh, in there and uh, this has some nice little explosion particles and stuff and we Use a lot of the tech of this. This is um, obviously the, the scaled sprites uh, and the sort of the rendered sprites. And you know, and the, the, it's one of the first games really that had this kind of detailed, high frame rate. I mean, for its time, uh, texture maps. I mean, so we kind of made use of them a lot on this stage, and got the graphics looking pretty nice. Um, some of these creatures are pretty cool. They're all scripted. Basically, one of the first scripting languages in a game really I think um, it was multi-threaded in a way as well you had one script that would run uh, on every single active object that you can see in the scene or even objects that you just created to run a script on so you actually had like a sort of multi uh, sort of micro threaded um, language kind of running all this stuff and that helped uh, develop the sort of interactive nature of the game as well because it let the uh, planners at Nintendo, the, the game designers like Iguchi or Yamada actually do a little bit of programming, like just a little bit, you know, to do the sort of the movement of the, the enemies and, and just little touches like that. They didn't have to rely on us so much, which meant that we could get on and do the harder stuff, you know, sort of like the boss implementations and more complex enemies and also a bit of the tech as well, like for example, um, optimizing the 3D sprite system and stuff like that. Oh, this boss is a, it's one of the uh, simpler ones. Um, I can't remember, but I think I may have programmed this one. Um, it's one of the first ones maybe I've programmed it. It's a little bit hard, maybe. Um, the, what's hard is that when that thing's spinning, it reflects all your shots back to you, which can hit you, which is a bit nasty. You can see it happening there. And, uh, but, I try to make it as fair as possible. There's all there's basically set sequences. So if you wait and you dodge and you spin yourself, you can kind of avoid most things. Um, and then you just have to time it right and then just shoot. As soon as you can see the, the flashing panels that show that it's uh, well, that show its weak points, uh, just shoot the hell out of it at that point. And also another good place for a smart bomb. That's always a, uh, one of my favorite go-to weapons, I think. Doing quite well here. There we go. Oh, watch out for that final bit of the end to kind of knock you out, but uh, I hope too many of you didn't get caught out by that. So working on Star Fox has really influenced us a lot in our um, sort of daily game development life. Um, 
obviously at Q Games we made Star Fox Command as well, which is you know even more Star Fox and Star Fox 3DS. Uh, but one of the things we learned, or I learned from working on Star Fox, is that how you can pull things from the environment. And one of those things for Star Fox was, was of course the Fox character itself, uh, which was pulled from the Fox shrine that was right near Nintendo at the time. And for a lot of our games, uh, we do that. So for example, Pixel Junk Scrappers Deluxe, which is coming out this year, um, is also pulls on Kyoto uh, in a kind of interesting way and kind of pulls on the themes uh, of Kyoto as well. And I think that's really important in games, you know, to kind of bring in a bit of the surrounding environment that you're working in, you know, a bit of the, 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 air, the things you're, you're seeing every day, and just kind of bring them into the game, let them bleed into the game a little bit. And that really kind of makes the game richer. And I think that really shows in Star Fox. Okay, so uh, this stage, and there was another stage similar to this, um, is kind of was kind of my baby because I was experimenting with sort of jointed systems and creating uh, sort of auto-generating things, really. And um, and I came up with this system where these these blocks would kind of grow into plants and kind of sprout into flowers and stuff like that as you fly past them. And it sort of caught the eye of uh, Miyamoto and the other the other designers on the team. And uh, they said, oh, okay, let's make a whole stage full of these. Uh, and we kind of went ahead and uh, basically did as much as we could with them and had a lot of fun with it, actually. So this also makes use of the, the map system of the events. And you see here, like, the, the objects are sprouting up out, out of the ground. Um, and it's quite simple, really, but it's just a lot of fun to make. Uh, it's, it's probably one of them, my favorite sort of experimental stages. You can see there the flowers kind of sprouting as, they, as it grows. And then we created this like, you know, with angles and, and uh, just added a lot to the gameplay. And you see here like, like water serpents. And this always is the same system, except that with the water serpents, obviously you have the tail follow it and sort of remove the objects off the back end as well. You see it came out pretty well. And uh, at the time, this was kind of like a fun, kind of new, almost like a new technology, I suppose, this kind of like auto-generating things and creating things on the fly uh, that kind of look more organic. And so this is probably one of my favorite stages and it's, it, it, yeah, it's got a lot of variation in it. And I just had a lot of fun making it. And then when we get to the boss, um, well, I can't remember which designer it was. I think it may have been Yamada who designed this boss and he kind of went to town on it and made a, like a crazy, chicken thing as a boss and said can we attach all this organic stuff as its neck you know and tail and then can we have it shoot the, the end of the tail and, and stuff like that and, uh, and basically <laughs> I went to town on it and uh, got it all working uh, as best I could but it's very uh, dynamic very sort of quite an exciting stage uh, especially probably when you first saw it when you first played it um, yeah I sometimes wish the frame rate we had a better frame rate but can't be helped, you know, you work within the limits you have at the time. And uh, we try to do, do as much as we could. Oh, here it is. So here's the, uh, the, the, the double-headed King Dodora. And uh, this thing, you can see it, it's this giant animated creature, very low poly, but we still, we still managed to get the detail out of it. And we attached a tail to the back and used the organic system to uh, basically animate it, so it's all there procedurally animated and these the skit the, the neck as well uh, the two necks are the same system and as you shoot the head you know it shortens the neck so everything's very procedural uh, which at the time there really wasn't much really out there that was procedural uh, that i can think of uh, so we did a lot of like very dynamic stuff at the time basically about having fun you know i think this took about three days to make uh, the whole boss sequence um, just getting it right, polishing it, uh, getting the model and animations, and then tuning it as well, um, making it so it's not too hard. I think it, was, it did end up being quite hard, but as you get the heads down to the body, then you can shoot the body. And it's another place that's good for a smart bomb. And you see, you know, we just look pretty simple. And oh, there you go, it's gone.
So the characters uh, in Star Fox, the design of them uh, came from, I mean, the, the actual art came from uh, Imamura-san, uh, who was one of the main artists, one of the main 2D, 2D artists at the time at Nintendo. Um, and of course, with Miyamoto's direction as well, uh, to kind of like direct what kind of characters were, were going into the game. Um, and then they came to my desk. Um, I'm not sure why they came to me, but maybe they wanted the uh, like good sounding sort of English names for these characters. And um, they'd had one design, uh, one name already decided, which was uh, Falco Lombardi. And the other three, they were like, well, this is a fox. This is a hare, you know, and, and this is a frog or a toad. And, um, and they said, well, what can we call it? And I kind of looked at them and I looked at the characters that drawn these like really nice sort of little, you know, sketches. And I said, okay, well, I think Fox needs to have a cool sounding name. Uh, and he's, he flies in spacecraft. So McLeod sounds pretty good. Let's give him McLeod. And for the other two, I kind of looked at them and I just kind of laughed because they, the, the, the names just came into our mind and I said, okay, we'll call this guy Slippy because he looks a bit slippery and this guy looks old but he looks like he's got lots of energy, let's call him Peppy and uh, that's where the names came from and they stuck, so it was a pretty, pretty fun moment in the development of the game. So this is one of the, the three sector stages, uh, which are kind of based on the Bandai Namco game Starblade, really. Um, there's a lot of parallels uh, in the way the stages are designed and some of the ideas that uh, went into the game. And if you haven't had a chance to play Starblade in the arcade, uh, it's, it's a really good, really good game. I mean, it's a it's more fixed path than even Star Fox, but it's, uh, but it's very well done. Uh, for the time. Great soundtrack as well. And uh, so part of this, yeah, and then we kind of, every, we kind of expanded uh, on the ideas in that for the space sequences um, and added even more structures like this and like puzzle elements that you have to fly through um, and kind of dodge and stuff like that. Because in Sabre there wasn't really any dodging because you, you didn't really fly dynamically. And so with this, we, we could play a lot more with this. Uh, and this stage, like all these very difficult sections, um, were pretty much designed by the, uh, the planners at Nintendo uh, using uh, our path scripting language and the map system, which we also made, uh, of course, which is to, like creating like, events as you go through and sort of the combination of those. And they just kind of went to town. I think this is probably one of the stages that they designed towards the end. So they kind of really, they were really getting used to like what they could do with the uh, system and kind of went a bit crazy with it, uh, made it pretty damn hard. Um, but of course it is the, on the hardest mode and also you know, near the end of the, the game, I suppose. Uh, you just have to kind of learn the patterns uh, and movements of all these things and just kind of make your way through. It's almost like a memory game at some points in this stage. So yeah, here, this is, this is obviously using the map event system and it's just like going crazy, creating lots and lots of wireframe uh, sort of, you know, pillars and to throw at you. And it's meant to be kind of like a junkyard, I seem to remember us talking about it at the time, but it's like, it's sort of like everything's like destroyed and you're flying through all the junk after uh, this destruction of maybe a space station or something like that. And, uh, you know, the wireframe stuff, I mean, it harkens back to, uh, the first game I made with Nintendo, which was called X uh, on the Game Boy, and that was all wireframe as well. And uh, it didn't, we didn't really, for, for X, uh, which was programmed only entirely just by myself, uh, we didn't really have the time, or I didn't have the time to kind of develop the system to this extent. But this is kind of the kind of thing that I wanted to do in with X as well. Um, and so, as you can see, this stage is pretty damn hard, lots of enemies. Uh, lots of structures to kind of dodge and if you're in the first person mode well you can really only play in the first mode so person mode to give you a chance here because I think one of the other things we do in first person mode is reduce the collision detection uh, on your ship a little bit we make it a bit smaller so you can actually squeeze tinier gaps in first person mode I really shouldn't be telling people that but um, 
basically when you're in the space mode, go to first person. Uh, you'll, you'll find it just a bit easier. I think I've programmed all these and I kind of like the idea of having arrows that you shoot out to change directions for the uh, platforms and stuff like that. And this is what we call the, uh, the washing machine boss internally. And this is one of Giles' bosses. And it's a fairly simple boss. It's like one of the first bosses that went into the game, or it was one of the earlier bosses, at least, that we developed in the game. And it, it's nice and simple, just a very easy to play kind of thing. You just have to watch out for those pesky uh, little ships that come flying towards you, shooting at you. So the worst bug that showed up uh, was one at the very last minute. Um, we were trying to get home before Christmas, and I think we had shipped to the lot check, which is their sort of you know, Nintendo's testing system, um, about three days before Christmas, and it came back with a bug on only the second version of the hardware that had shipped. Uh, maybe there were only 50,000 units of this, this Super Nintendo out there in the world, but it was the second version, and only the second version we had this bug on the, you know, the, the sort of stage select screen. And we were just getting like junk on the screen for no reason on this one Super Nintendo. Uh, we couldn't work out why, and uh, it, well, we got called back to kind of do this um, at like 3 a.m. in the morning, because they had to, they really needed it to kind of be ready for Christmas so we could actually go home. Um, we were there at 3am and were very blurry eyed and kind of looking at the code and, and I was looking at the code that was transferring the data over to the screen and I was trying to work out like why, why would this cause glitches, you know, why would it cause like junk to appear on the screen and, uh, and I thought okay well it's doing it on DMA channel 3, I'm just going to switch the DMA channel to 2 and see what happens and it fixed it and that was it. Um, we still don't know why, uh, but we managed to go home. We were home for Christmas, so, you know, whatever it was, thank God for, you know, DMA Channel 2. Now, this is one of the harder stages, I think. Uh, so hard, I think I've blocked it from my memory. Basically, uh, I, think, I think this stage, it might have... Yeah, those guys. So I animated those guys. Those, uh, those big walkers, um, very early in the stage, uh, very early in the development of the game, uh, I was just playing with the animation and I created that uh, little animated sequence for those walkers just to test the system and uh, they ended up putting it in the game. Uh, but it was only meant to be a test, so that's a programmer art at its finest. Um, this stage is a very short um, display distance on purpose. It's meant to sort of emulate like a small world, so you've got like a, meant to have like a very near horizon. Um, I found it quite hard this stage. Well, I remember playing it now and uh, when we were testing through it and adding some stuff to it. Um, but it uses the map event system to create this kind of like very near feeling, so you like you kind of have to react a lot. So things appear very close to you and then you have to react very quickly uh, when they appear. There's my walker again. He's, he's cute. Oh, another one, okay. It made him a bit easier to destroy, probably because they didn't want to like, show the animation to its completion, because there was a dodgy frame at the end of it. Uh, so it made them easy to blow up, I think. <laughs> this makes good use of the um, our technique of fogging uh, to kind of bring in the colors on the objects, you know, by dithering. So dithering is a technique where you see the sort of stippled pattern on the, on the colors and on the polygons. You see those big rocks, they start off dark and sort of red, and then they kind of begin to get red and redder and yellow. Um, so they're coming in from shadow. And that was a pretty cool technique at the time, I thought. Um, considering we only had 16 colors, uh, we used that to quite good effects. We managed to have like a, a way to kind of darken colors um, by using this like stippling effect. Yeah, this is one of the very final bosses we made, I think. Um, Really towards the end of the project because we were kind of running out of time so it's quite 
it's a simplistic box, but we still managed to add like a lot of animation to it uh, and kind of, yeah, kind of a lot of flourish. Um, when we began building bosses, um, yeah, we maybe have like a little experiment or something like we did on the on Fortune with the uh, basically the designers would come over with like maybe like a one page or two page kind of like a very light spec for what they were kind of imagining the boss to be like. Uh, and then we'd kind of start programming it and throwing in all our own ideas um, and really kind of making our own thing. Uh, and then feeding back to the planners like what we want and kind of what new models we want for it and what animations we want to kind of make it work. Um, and it was a very collaborative process in that sense. So yeah, there's no, it's very much, we're just kind of making it together and coming up with ideas and throwing them in and seeing what's you know, stuck uh, as we, we, we went along and just kind of really enjoying ourselves. Uh, very, very, it was a very, very creative process. The one big development lesson that I learned on that game uh, was to consider the game as a whole uh, and not just the initial five minutes, uh, you know, of sort of the technical you know, the, the prowess side of it. Because growing up in the UK, um, a lot of the games for, say, the 8-bit computers at the time, or even Amiga games, really, uh, kind of focused on just the first bit to kind of hook you in. And then the game was either very short or not really fleshed out properly. So you didn't really get like a sort of gradual increase of like expectation as you played the game. And working with Nintendo, um, it really, kind of taught me to to consider the whole thing and, and not to put everything at the beginning and just kind of and build up like the expectation of the player as they play through the game and kind of build that up because then you can actually give them like really good sort of emotional beats as they go through the game uh, and that was a great lesson. Now we come on to the, the last most difficult stages. Um, this is also a stage to play uh, in first-person mode, and uh, yeah, missiles come up from the from the planet below, and well, I mean, just everything gets thrown at you on this stage. I think I remember dying a lot on this stage when I was uh, test playing it, and um, but it's basically using all the same elements from the from like all the previous stages. It's kind of something that Nintendo does, right? So they have lots of different ideas and things they put in all the different stages then towards the end they just start bringing everything in uh, and the kitchen sink uh, so most of these enemies in this stage um, at this point were, were created by the planning team uh, of Nintendo because they could actually use our path language to get at least simple you know attack kind of movements like this you know little paths and things coming up and just things shooting at you it was all pretty simple to do this also takes a lot of inspiration from games like Star Wars and, and Star Blade and stuff like that. And also just throws in that extra bit of spice where you've got, you know, your friends flying around with you with the, uh, you know, that was, a, that was a kind of a new thing at the time, you know, having these comrades that kind of fly with you. We just had a, a lot of fun knocking up stuff and playing these stages, because I mean, what the great thing is because we didn't have to work so directly on these stages, it meant that we kind of get to play them uh, as the player does. So when they wanted us to try out stuff or, or take a look at the stage, we'd actually just play it through and uh, kind of enjoy ourselves uh, as if we were actually consumers, you know, actually playing the game. On average, each boss took about two or three days, and roughly about that. Some bosses were actually a bit quicker, maybe. Uh, we had a pretty good system for, for knocking up um, the bosses. Sometimes, yeah, we go back to it a couple of weeks later to refine something about it or just add a little extra touch, but pretty much, really two or three days, the boss. And we just added a lot of movement, a lot of flair to the, each one as we made them. So even in the first version that we kind of made, um, they'd already be working quite well. And uh, then they just need a little bit of refinement after a bit of a play test and a, you know, sort of a bit of back and forth. And, uh, it was, yeah, it was pretty good. I mean, there's a lot of bosses in the game. And there were only really three of us from Argonaut at Nintendo at the time. We never made a game like this really before ever. So we were all pretty new at it. And we just kind of got on with it. And we made the game in 
10 or 11 months, uh, maybe 12 months max. You know, managed to get everything in there somehow. I'm still kind of amazed. Without working ridiculously hard either. Like, a, it was a little bit, a little bit tough at the end, but we just, we just kind of had our heads down. There was no internet to, to distract us. Uh, we just kind of got on with it, got our heads down and got on with it. So there isn't really one sort of favorite episode. There's quite a quite a lot of things that happen during the development of all those Star Foxes. I mean, there's a lot of Star Foxes to make. Um, when we were making the original Star Fox, uh, Miyamoto and the team, um, yeah, they're quite happy to kind of show up Japan to uh, the foreigners, the, the Gaijin star uh, who had just turned up. And uh, they took the three of us, me, Giles, and Krista, uh, out to fireworks uh, in Fuji. And it was in, it must have been around summertime, maybe like August, sometime like that. And uh, well, Nintendo used to sponsor, they, maybe they still do, but they, they had a factory in Fuji, um, which is south of Kyoto. Um, and they sponsored the fireworks um, if, uh, uh, that, that were launched near this big river that, that goes through the, the region. And so we all went there and uh, Miyamoto and a couple of others, I think they drove us there. I think that's, I think that's uh, how I remember it. And we parked and then we kind of had to go through this convoluted route to get to the bank of the river to be able to see the fireworks. And there were so many flies. I have never seen, even until now, I've never seen that many flies. Like, I don't know what was going on, like why there were so many flies, but there were, it was absolutely crazy. And in order to get to the, the side of the bank to see the fireworks, we had to go this like, through this like, it was like from a horror movie of uh, flies. And we, we rushed through and the flies are like splatting against our face and our clothes. <laughs> As we were going through, and like Miyamoto and all the other, you know, the, um, you know Eguchi and all the, all the other guys were also just <laughs> trying to escape from all these flies. And we got through and it's like the most weirdest, surrealist kind of um, uh, thing that happened, I think, on the original, the original game. I've never seen, since then, I've never ever seen anything like that before. Uh, I have no idea why or, or how that situation occurred like uh, who knows um, but it's definitely a very distinct memory for me okay so this uh, stage is full of little map gimmicks it's actually kind of fun this one um, I helped a lot on this one uh, helped Yamada who was the main map editor um, but I also kind of got into this a little bit I wanted to I created these like um, uh, switchable vehicle balls and, and stuff like that and kind of just had a lot of fun with him making this uh, to make it very very uh, feel very dynamic it's probably, it's probably one of kind of one of the better stages I think um, in the game it's not too hard it's just full of like these kind of dynamic elements you know like these pillars flying above you kind of landing in front of you and it, it's just a very I think a very nice uh, stage in general these are the same tanks from it. Hey, that, that's created by the map system, so we didn't actually do anything there to, to create those objects on the screen. That's just basically the map generating them as, as you fly through. Uh, here we go. So the, these are kind of fun. So um, you shoot these to change the direction, and they kind of slam in that direction. So you have to be kind of quick on your feet to make sure you don't screw this up. Oh, <laughs> this happened right there. Um, and this is kind of fun. And uh, actually, it's one of the stages that uh, Miyamoto himself kind of complimented us on at the time, because uh, me and Yamada were kind of getting into it and kind of adding all this stuff and kind of enjoying ourselves. And uh, Miyamoto liked all the interactive elements like this, because I don't, I mean, in shooting games at least up until then, there hadn't really been too much of this kind of interactive stuff going on. And it was uh, kind of a very new thing, I think, at the time. So this is this is one of the probably one of the last stages we made. Oh, there's my walker again. See that it gets everywhere. Um, yeah, my my very bad animation. Unfortunately, because it's the last or you know one of the last stages on the hardest route, 
probably means that not that many people have played this stage out of the whole number of people who have played Star Fox. Um, but I definitely recommend people skip to it and have a, have a, have a blast with it. Uh, was on Star Fox Command, and it was in our old office here in Kyoto. And uh, it was, that was also in the height of summer. Uh, don't worry, it doesn't involve flies. Basically, we were in a bit of debugging the multiplayer side of that, which is quite hard work, because uh, we were one of the first games that kind of used the sort of the cartridge uh, downloading system for the multiplayer on, on the DS. And um, we, we were hard at work, and the air conditioning broke. And we kind of had these deadlines and milestones uh, to, like, you know, to, to get data to Nintendo for um, debugging and stuff like that. And so we had to carry on working, but it's like in the height of summer in Kyoto with no air conditioning. I suppose it, at the time it wasn't pleasant, but it was actually kind of almost like adventurous. It kind of felt like we were out like on the Nile in Egypt or something. You know, we, we had to like wear the most minimum clothes. We had to get these giant industrial fans into the office uh, opening the windows doesn't help at all because it's so humid and then we had this this bug and uh you know we're just staring at the screen sweat dripping down our faces while we're trying to debug this uh this issue we were having uh and it it was just crazy times um but i find that some of the you know the crazy times are sometimes what you remember the most and you remember even if it was weird or tough at the time, it was actually, it ends up being like the most enjoyable memory uh, of the situation. And, and, you know, so basically, if you ever encounter anything like that yourself, you know, rather than um, think, oh, this is terrible, maybe think that maybe in about 10 years, you'll be looking back and having a good laugh about it. And I think that's really, really good advice for any game developer out there. So the uh, the boss and the sort of the, the sort of sequence leading up to this is made by Charles, and um, it's basically a variant of the boss on the other courses, um, except like you know it, it's um, a little bit more evil looking, I suppose. Oh, don't get sucked into the mouth. <laughs> there's a little bit, there's a sort of a funny anecdote about what that animation is uh, miming, and apparently it's a rude word in Japanese. Um, we couldn't get the Japanese artist to tell us exactly what the word is, but it's a rude word apparently, so we'll let our listeners <laughs> try and work out what that is. Oh, there, you think you've destroyed it, because you've obviously, you've obviously done this twice already. Oh, but oh no, what happens? As evil face, whatever that is. Um, so th this is just like a little variant on the other two bosses, really. The other two bosses, I think, were almost exactly the same. And for this one, there's just like a little extra bit added uh, just to give people a bit of extra fun and to kind of freak them out a bit maybe as well, give them nightmares. There's some voice recording at the end, isn't there? Obviously, one of the special things about Star Fox is the fact that you have these sort of voices um, coming in, which back in those days uh, really wasn't a thing. Um, and uh, I'm not sure who did the final well, voice or maybe it was a mixture of uh, a couple of people saying it. Um, I recorded one set of samples to be used in the game, but then uh, I'm not sure if they got used or if they got blended or mixed uh, to make the actual final words, but uh, I do remember recording them. Uh, I just don't know if they were used or not, because I can't tell from the... because the, the amount of processing on the voice, you can't really tell who it is. But uh, it'd be kind of fun to find out who actually did those, who did the voices and whether my voice was used or whether uh, it was Dan Olsen at, at Nintendo of America. I'm not sure. We'll never, maybe we'll never find out. Well, I've really enjoyed uh, looking through this uh, sequence of stages and, and, and basically reliving um, some of the things that happened. Uh, you know, it does really jog your memory when you, when you see these sequences and you see these bosses and some of these things that I'd just forgotten, you know, lost the memory of. And, uh, and I think it's, it's just great to kind of go back sometimes and have a look through and just remember uh, the little things that happened around, you know, around the sort of the outskirts, you know, when we were making this game. 
Uh, there are all these little things around the fringe of, of our team where, you know, for example, uh, at one point we all went to the arcade to play, you know, uh, Starblade, um, and at other points, uh, like in the middle of the night, we were working late uh, on one final milestone, and we all went off to the uh, the local convenience store with Miyamoto, and Miyamoto was saying how much he likes McFitty's chocolate biscuits, and just just really amusing little anecdotes like that. And then watching this old, you know, watching these uh, these stages from this, you know, very old game now, um, it's just really, really. Uh, nostalgic, really cool. Thanks for watching, thanks for listening. Fox, of course, because he's cool. I have many favorite bosses, but one of my favorites to make was the dancing insector. So I'll go with him. Uh, my favorite Star Fox is probably Star Fox Command. I think it has the most interesting ideas and kind of experiments in it. I think obviously there are a few things we could have expanded on more, but it's, it's my favorite. That would have to be the, the way you get to out of this dimension. I think that was pretty sneaky. There was one that was marginally more difficult, and that was the King Lotherer. Uh, it had lots of moving parts, lots of new kind of tech, and it was just kind of, it was a bit more fiddly, let's say. Use bombs wisely. Well, we're working on Pixel Jump Scrappers Deluxe for PlayStation, PC, and Switch, and that is a really good game. And we're also uh, working on updates for the Tomorrow Children, which is on PlayStation 4 and 5. And on top of that, we're working on a couple of, or maybe even three, secret things. Um, more to be announced about those uh, in the future. Thanks to everyone who's sent in questions. Uh, it's been a lot of fun celebrating 30 years of Star Fox. And we have a signed bundle of goodies to give out. Uh, so if you're interested in getting those, um, head over to our Twitter feed, which is at Pixel Junk News. And uh, wow, well, to see you there. And, uh, See you again soon. Good luck. <laughs>